Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Colin Holbrook. He is an assistant professor of cognitive and information sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles. He researches decision making under contexts of threat with particular focus on political orientation, group prejudice, and the representation of mental states. So, Dr. Holbrook, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so today, as I've already alluded to in the introduction, we're going to talk a lot about threat and how people deal with threat and how they perceive threat. So the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, so when you're studying threat, you not only you consider both uh, objective threats, that is, for example, if I am threatened by someone that is bigger than me, for example, but also, uh, uh, let's say, psychological internal states where people perceive threat, even, even if it's not something that has a, an outside reference, let's say, that is just some sort of threat salience or something like that, correct? Well, there's two ways to take that, so I should clarify which, if you mean uh, one or maybe both. Um, the first would be what most people, so my methods are primarily, I'm an interdisciplinarily oriented researcher, but most of the work that I do is essentially social psychology. Um, that's where most of it um, is published in terms of journals, and those are the questions I'm usually asking. So in social psychology, People who study threat usually are doing it in terms of a sort of internal state, something like the threat of feeling anxiety or the threat of maybe uh, being perceived as racist or being um, prejudiced in some way. Or uh, many, many people study variations on threats to one's sense of one's own identity and this kind of in internal constructs. So that's what almost everybody does. I'm not very interested in that, um, partly because people are taking care of it. Uh, they've got it. Uh, they don't. I don't think the world needs another one. With apologies to grad students who are trying to be the next one. Um, I'm more interested in, and in, in the the other way of, of glossing what you meant by an internal kind of threat is representations of genuine threats in the world. Um, how do we represent those within the mind? How do we conceptualize and reason about things like uh, who will win in a fight or um, the possibilities of contracting a disease from a pathogenic person? Um, th there's very interesting questions about how internally those threats are represented, but the theoretical focus is on the, basically how an organism navigates through the actual world, the actual environment. Whereas predominantly in social psychology, there's at least an implicit kind of clinical orientation where you hear words like adaptive and what they really mean is you're having a nice day. They're not talking about your, your biological um, adaptation in, in, in any sense that a biologist would recognize. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well, but I mean, at least sometimes even if there's a real threat outside, people ex exaggerate it, right, internally. Oh yes, and I'm very much interested in that. and, and uh, I mean, one of the most obvious places to look for things like that is with regard to intergroup prejudices and biases. So I've done a little bit of work on perceptions of refugees, for example. And, you know, are there violent people amongst the refugees? Of course. Um, it's probably, I don't know the empirical fact on the ground, but probably fewer than are in the domestic population in terms of how many, you know, bad, bad apples are there. But yeah, there's some. Um, but you see a number of factors, individual differences and so forth, uh, things like political orientation and other things that may lead people to greatly exaggerate the, the degree of threat uh, for, from a group or from a, an outside source. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and the way people perceive threat, does it have anything to do with, uh, with what people sometimes talk about as being fight or flight responses. Perhaps this is a bit more associated with biology or perhaps evolutionary psychology, but does it have anything to do with it? 
Thank you for teeing up that question, because this is a little bit of a hobby horse, um, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, so, yes, of course, um, I, a fight or flight response is certainly a kind of um, paradigmatic threat response. Um, if you look in the encyclopedia, there it is. You know that, that's what you would expect. However, oh, and this is certainly um, owes a lot to our um, evolved uh, characteristics of the mind. Um, Certainly. But one, um, again, I think it's not necessarily an explicit position that most people hold, but it's sort of an implicit and unregarded assumption, is that cognition that is less reflexive, less automatic, less kind of conventionally associated with things like the um, ventral pathways through the brain and so forth, uh, or with autonomic responses, People tend to think that more deliberative, more cortical kinds of cognition are somehow less evolved. And I think that is a very unhelpful assumption that clouds um, important discoveries that could be made about how people reason about threat and the extent to which evolution plays a part in shaping the contours of our reasoning system when it comes to understanding different kinds of threats. So I would certainly agree that fight or flight is, is part of it and interesting, but I wouldn't stop there at all. I have a much more encompassing um, sort of category of how evolution plays into threat recognition systems. Um, so for example, and of course, for this interview, I can't pull the name right now. Let me think of it later. But there's some very interesting research showing that you can show people just photographs of two different kinds of threats. Um, and forgive me, it's gonna be a little gross. So one is things like unflushed toilets, like very disgusting um, threats that are just images, but they're associated with real pathogens in the world. And the other is violent imagery, things like uh, guns pointed directly at, at your face. And they make sure that they're sort of equivalent in their overall arousal and so forth, but they differ in their content. And what some researchers have found is that you have reflexive, um, an, a whole suite of responses. So both higher level shifts in, with regards to tendencies to want to approach other people, um, make physical contact with them and so forth, but also and very interestingly, even shifts in the immune response. Uh, for example, um, bodily shifts as, as though the body were preparing for a pathogenic insult, um, perhaps to be ingested orally or something, that can happen just upon viewing these images. And you see very interesting domain-specific differences. So on the one hand, it's, it's, a, it's a very high-level um, psychological process to look at two pictures, one of a gun and one of an unflushed toilet, and to, make, to derive meaning from those images. And a lot of um, understanding and learning, for example, in, in the ancestral past, there were no guns or toilets for that matter. I'm, I'm sure there was poo, but there, but there were no guns or toilets. And yet, um, through processes that are largely cultural and developmental, we can identify those objects, infer the meaning, these are threats. But then you get this incredible biological sort of prepared response that appears, I think, unambiguously evolved. And so some people will want to sort of arbitrarily say, oh, well, the parts that recognize the unflushed toilet versus the gun are all in some sense non-evolved. And then they somehow interact with an evolved system which says, oh, oh, there's pathogens in my environment, prepare the immune system. I don't know how, I, I just, I'm not, I just think we should question that assumption because it may be more, in a way, more parsimonious to think of a pathogen detection system which incorporates learning and all number of uh, sort of conventionally higher cortical uh, systems. But to see all of these as kind of a suite that's thematically related and has to some important and interesting extent an evolved characteristic that we were prepared um, for detecting and avoiding pathogens, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess that I also asked you that question because I mean, perhaps when people think long answer sorry <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah but don't worry about that but perhaps when people think about threats the first thing that pop into their minds is that 
when someone is threatened, the first instinct would be for them to just try to fly away or run away from that threat. But another possibility, and you already referred to, for example, how people deal with threat in contexts of politics, for example, and with people from other groups. And uh, another way of dealing with that is for them to try to eliminate that threat, right? Yes, and I think that's true across different domains. Um, so we're not to spend the whole time talking about unflushed toilets and things. But, um, but just for example, with disgust, there's good reason to think that a certain amount of what you might conventionally call approach motivation makes sense. I mean, how many, I don't know if they do this in Brazil, but I assume they do. Have you ever had someone say to you, oh, this is disgusting, do you want some? <laughs> or, oh, this smells terrible, here, smell it. Um, this is an anecdote, right? This is anecdata. But it's sort of telling, and I think to a great extent, certain kinds of threats, especially when they're, when there's ambiguous detection of the signal, you know, hey, was that um, a branch scraping the window or is there an intruder outside? There's, it's often an adaptive move to go investigate and to approach. And perhaps if you ascertain that there is a, a genuine threat, to remove it. Um, which again is an approach kind of behavior. So it's going to be context dependent, and I think it would be wildly overly simplistic to say that threats lead you to avoid or to withdraw. When it comes to violent intergroup conflict, which is, I've actually done much more research on appraisals with regard to violent humans than I have um, sources of pathogens and, 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 co and things that would elicit disgust. Um, again, it's the same logic. So you may have skin in the game. Um, I'm a parent, for example. I don't care how big or how likely to win some um, hostile human would be. I am going to approach and I'm going to fight if it's a circumstance where they're threatening my my little boy, for example. And you can substitute in little boy something else that you or your uh, you know viewers might value. Uh, but there's often um, circumstances where we are incentivized to attack, and there's also circumstances where we just appraise that we can win. We, we, we sort of look at the lay of the land, and this is one of the interesting things about this emerging research on political orientation, is it appears to be in sort of to one side of moral considerations. Liberals or progressives seem, unfortunately, um, depending or fortunately, depending on your political stance, uh, to be more timid and to view their group as less likely to win in conflict, whereas um, conservatives, especially um, conservatives defined by um, a militaristic kind of foreign policy orientation, as you would expect, they appraise enemies as more defeatable, but also as more hostile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and so so it, it depends on a great many things. Yes, exactly. So, but anyway, the psychology of threat and threat perception, let's say, works at both the individual and the collective levels, right? Well, if you mean I mean, taking you literally, if you mean, does a group, I, no, I don't think you mean what I thought you meant. You don't mean, does the group have some kind of emergent consciousness that, I don't maybe, that's that's a different Oh, oh, oh no, no, no. But, no, but no, you I, mean I, in terms of appraising a group or a person. Yes, definitely. And I've done it in kind of both ways, but I typically, I believe that we more often than not reason about groups as though they were people and along some, something like a conceptual metaphor. Um, you know, people will think about Al Qaeda or ISIS or or political opponents, even often in terms of exemplars or sort of um, prototypes that are more akin to um, to individuals or smaller groups, and then make appraisals in a kind of um, heuristic way. This may be a time to talk a little bit about the formidability representation work um, that I've done. So just very briefly. Uh, this is work done with my colleague uh, Dan Fessler at UCLA. Uh, we conducted a great many studies um, approaching the idea that people decide who will win in a conflict, not entirely, but largely um, using a, a kind of evolved rule of thumb or, or heuristic, where they essentially conceptualize the threat someone poses in terms of a metaphor of size and strength. So holding a firearm, for example, has no objective effect on your height or your muscularity 
or your overall size. But we found across studies that factors that would increase the threat someone poses leads them to be imagined as physically larger. And this could include being in a group that's thought of as violent. So we found this for um, in a sort of un somewhat depressing, but perhaps not un at all unexpected finding because in the United States, um, African Americans and Latinos are derogated as, as violent. We found that characters just assigned Latino or African American uh, sounding names were automatically imagined as big, tall, uh, muscular, and, and, and prone to violence. Um, but we also found this in terms of letting someone know, just depicting an image where you can't see the entire body, but just a kitchen knife, something as simple as that. Um, in one set of studies, uh, this was shown to increase the imagined physical size and strength of the person, which makes sense because all we've told you about them is that they have a, a sharp object which has lethal affordances. And in an, another set of, 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 of studies that's kind of complementary, we found that showing someone, even if you frame them as just someone who loves gardening and is holding gardening shears, automatically leads you to make a bunch of inferences about their emotional state and their personality. So when you compare gardening shears guy to watering can guy, framed only as avid gardeners, so these aren't depicted as overtly threatening individuals, you find that these target characters are imagined as more angry, more prone to anger, less prone to squeamishness, less trustworthy. Any number of shifts in the social judgment and appraisal of that person's emotions and character, which are extremely sensible because all, this person has a very sharp object in their hand. Even one that's not conventionally associated or shown in movies. I don't know of a horror movie that shows you know, the garden shear massacre or murderer. Um, and yet we found um, pretty um, medium to large-ish effect sizes that people would instantly make this appraisal. And, and at any rate, I'm rambling. But, but, but uh, most of this, if you have questions, especially regarding um, appraisals of individuals, that's, that's, that's what I've studied the most. And it's the most dangerous topic for rambling. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So just before we get into that, uh, how does this connect with uh, group prejudice then? Because, I mean, what happens psychological in uh, psychologically in people uh, when they have uh, some sort of threat coming from people from out groups? Uh, how, what changes in them in terms of how they look at uh, people from their own group and other people that are sort of making the threat? Well, it seems that there's a distribution of responses, which, um, so, so individual difference moderators are very important. One, um, I mentioned political orientation earlier. So just to briefly repeat that, what we find is that in general, political conservatives are more likely to view an ambiguous person as threatening. So um, we have an expression, you know, people with a hammer, all you see are nails. Um, well, if you have a, on average, and, and individuals will differ, but on average and across studies, people with a more conservative orientation, when shown someone who's not clearly um, malevolent, but there's some possibility that they may be, they do two things. One, they're more likely to view them as a threat. And two, they're more likely to be very confident that they can annihilate the threat and to be inclined to do that. And this will take the form of, uh, for example, wanting to initiate wars or even use nuclear weapons um, or other kinds of, of conventional weapons. It can also take the form of, of believing that we should have draconian um, closed borders and also NSA type surveillance and things like that to closely surveil and monitor anyone from a group that's, that's perceived as potentially threatening. Um, that, that's the case of political orientation. Um, we've also found interesting effects with regard to parenting. Um, however, that, 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 that doesn't tie into group bias. Um, but since I mentioned it, it may be of interest to say that for a very different set of reasons, parents are more, are, are more, parents are inclined to perceive ambiguous figures also as potentially threatening to a greater extent than non-parents in our research. And this is apparent probably because they, they're considerable 
incentives for them from um, a reproductive fitness point of view to remain healthy and alive. And when you have parents, for example, we did a field study some years ago now, I don't know why of all the things I'm pulling this out, but we did an interesting farmer's market field study in Los Angeles where we just approached um, women in the presence of children or not. Most of them were mothers, some were nannies. But just the presence of children, and especially in mothers, led them to imagine ambiguous characters as more menacing, more threatening, and bigger and stronger, um, probably in an effort to um, avoid potentially dangerous men. Mm -hmm. okay. I guess you have, group bias. you have specific questions because because we've also done work. Another thing to mention about uh, group bias, I should say, is one thing that's often confused about this work which is I'm talking about mental representations. Uh, words to use here are like imagine, envision, or conceptualize. What I'm not talking about is actual online perception. So there is emerging work, and I've been quite skeptical about this because, well, you know, at the margins, you might expect some very slight but detectable influence, sort of top-down influence on perception, whereby stereotype-based expectations would change what you actually see. I was sort of agnostic and a bit skeptical that there would be particularly meaningful effects, but I've looked at some new work in the last year that actually indicates that there are a bunch of college students in Michigan were shown images of um, young men and women with their either with their shirts off, where you could actually see their musculature, you can literally see it, and they varied whether they were uh, Asian, white, or African American. And they did the same thing for, for women, except they had shirts on, but somewhat form-fitting shirts. And they actually found effects of race where with, with the white group, this is mostly white um, population, or in terms of the, the sample of the study, they find that these participants actually think that men of men or women, but especially men, of totally equivalent body types, they they seem to be seeing them, or at least it's hard to say what's going on in their head. It's a black box. But in front of their head are totally equivalent images. The same level of musculature. It's the same. The skin tone is different. Some facial morphology may be slightly different. But they're the same bodies. And yet people will say that the Asian um, character is weaker. Or not character. These are real students. Um, that the Asian students are weaker and the black students are stronger. And that looks to me like something perhaps like actual online perceptual distortion based on stereotype um, information. So who knows? I mean, this, this is emerging work. So there may actually be visual distortions of some kind. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer. It's, it's something I'm going to be looking at in the next few years. Okay, very well. So now let's get into some more specific topics that I find very interesting coming from your work. And so you wrote an article titled Battle of Wits, Warfare Cues and Political Orientation Modulate the Perceived Intellect of Allies versus Adversaries. So could you tell us about that study in your own words and the results that you get, that you, that you got, sorry. Yeah, th thank you for the question. This is a very new work done. I have an ongoing uh, collaboration with Angel Gomez, and who is um, a Spanish re researcher. And so th this was a cross-cultural project where, just for logistical reasons, um, primarily, we ended up comparing Spanish participants to um, participants from the United Kingdom. And we essentially gave them completely parallel surveys. Of, except, of course, that one was in Spanish uh, and one was in English. And I believe we changed the names of the in-group character. So uh, John versus Juan, for instance. Um, but what we were trying to find out is whether cues of violent conflict would modulate the degree of intelligence and strategic competence attributed to an ally or an in-group ally or an adversary. And in these studies, this was an ISIS militant, um, someone who wanted to, you know, overtly commit violence. So this isn't a refugee who some people might think is threatening. This is a, a real, you know, a bad guy, so to speak. And um, what we found was really striking because these were large samples and, and this was a cross-cultural project. So while there were some differences around the edges, and you can look at the tables and, like, see, you know, uh, some sort of small differences – 
the main effect with reg- so the, well, what we did was we showed people just a brief video um, of of uh, of actual violent conflict versus a control stimulus. Um, and when people saw the actual violent conflict, they tended to rate the ally as more intelligent than the adversary. And this was related to perceptions of confidence in the group's capacity to win. And when we looked, we sort of drilled down to see what was driving it. You can imagine that it could be derogation of the outgroup. So, oh, those ISIS guys are stupid. But that would be extremely not um there are there are obvious functional disadvantages to underestimating the cunning of one's enemy however there's also a case to be made for having confidence in your group's ability to um coordinate and successfully engage in conflict and defeat an enemy once conflict has erupted And so what we expected and what we found in both of these studies was a kind of Goldilocks type compromise, where on the one hand, we do see this bias favoring the ally over the adversary, but it's not about underestimating the adversary so much as it is about perhaps overestimating or having greater confidence in the allies, not just sort of um, being a good guy, but specifically being strategically competent and intelligent and skillful. And and just as a just as a function of briefly viewing uh, about a, a a very short video of a couple of minutes, so that was, so that was an interesting result with regards to this sort of state effects, the immediate online effects of being exposed to violent intergroup conflict stimuli. But we were also looking at political orientation, with sort of a similar set of of predictions where we thought based on prior work that we had done and that many other labs have done. We thought that we would see political conservatives being more confident in aggressing against um, an outgroup, in this case ISIS. And this being the case, it seemed natural to predict that they would also perceive the ally as more intelligent, and we certainly found that. But again, and very interestingly, it wasn't about derogating the outgroup. It wasn't about thinking that the ISIS character was stupid or incompetent. It was about having greater confidence in the the ally in this case uh, a member of the the home country's security forces Mm -hmm. okay and still about war because i think it is a very interesting topic isn't it also the case that one thing that people do or at least they do unconsciously but it works is that if soldiers are marching at the same time and at the same pace and perhaps many of the most of the time they are also singing and they feel that they are part of that band of brothers as they say sometimes uh, th- does it also serve the function of reducing threat salience and making them feel more confident when they're going against the enemy? It, it does seem to be the case. I've, I've actually, this is an um, interesting thing to discuss because within the confines of the Formidability Representation Research Project, my colleagues and I actually looked at this from both directions. So we looked at it from the direction of the participant um, who's assessing a potential adversary. And we, and then in another study, we had them evaluating um, potential allies or adversaries not being in, in, let me put this more clearly. In one case, we actually had them synchronize. So they were the ones synchronizing. And, and on the other side, we had them listen to whether people were synchronized or not. And in both cases, we had them assess the, the imagined or conceptualized uh, height, size, and strength of the people. So the first study that we did was actually at the, on the UCLA campus. This was again with my um, frequent collaborator, Dan Fessler. We had them, uh, students were recruited in a field study. They were on their way back to the dorms or wherever they were heading on campus, but we had set aside and taped off with orange cones and tape and so forth. Roughly a, what we would call a soccer field, I guess a football field uh, um, length pathway and we just asked them to walk uh, to the end and back. And I actually am very much opposed to deception in research, especially in social psychology. It's used far too often and it's usually not necessary. And um, it has it damages the science as well as it's, uh, last time I checked, wrong uh, to lie to people. 
But in this case, um, we thought it was necessary to um, use a little bit of deception uh, to, to test our hypothesis. And so we had a confederate who we would actually go to the lanes of pretending to recruit them in front of the other participant. And it was, in fact, the same person who we had like seven outfits that they kept changing into so that people wouldn't see it was the same person. Um, and they were trained to walk in step with the other person. So whatever the other person did, our confederate was very good at just synchronizing with them. A very subtle kind of thing. They're strangers. They're not friends who are walking in lockstep. And these aren't even military officers or anything. They're just people. They're just um, college students. And the walk to and from took about five minutes, I would say. And this experience of walking in synchrony with only one other person, not a whole platoon, led to a, um, a notable tendency to imagine a violent um, adversary as small and weak. But what was interesting is we included a measure, you mentioned a band of brothers. We included in the survey uh, questions about feeling connected to the other person. And at the outset of the research, we thought this would be a potential mediator, that synchrony would lead to feeling bonded in some sense with this other person and that you together would sort of form one synchronized unit and be more formidable because you're coordinating, but that this emotional sense of bonding could be a proximate mediator of this effect. Not true. When we looked at it, it was completely, so yes, um, synchronizing did lead people to feel closer in a very big effect. So. That happened. And yes, synchronizing led people to view this uh, enemy as smaller and weaker. Fine so far. But when you look at a mediation analysis or just a correlation, there's nothing there. So the effects of synchrony, in, at least in our study, did not have to do with feeling close. That may be, well be because the other person was a stranger. Um, perhaps in more naturalistic conditions where you're synchronized with your actual friends, synch then that feeling of an heightened bonding might might be an important factor but it wasn't in that study and then when we did online research so notice in this in these studies we're asking people to write to um rate the size and strength of someone so we can't really show them a picture of their body we can't show them videos of them walking in synchrony or not so to get around that we had them listen to audio recordings which we manipulated to have them either be in pretty close synchrony or clearly all over the place and you can um if anyone's curious this stuff's all on my website uh, and you can download all the stimuli and the MP3s and so, so on are archived. Anyway, in that study, once again, we find it's not about perceived bonding, but that groups that are marching together on these audio recordings are imagined to be bigger and stronger. And they're imagined to be more intensive, like there to be one entity. And they're imagined to be better able to coordinate, to sort of in a, in, which in a, in a combat context is very important. But uh, we didn't find that, that th these effects were really related strongly to them being bonded closely together. And that was interesting and unexpected. So, so um, there's definitely more to be done. But it's not all about bonding, app apparently. Mm -hmm. Yes, OK. And what happens in the case of religious people? That is, for example, if people feel or think that they have uh, some sort of God on their side and if they're going against another group and if they think that their God will favor them in a war or in any other context of conflict, uh, does that have a, an effect in terms of threat salience or, or not? It does appear to. And uh, I've said a lot about political orientation so far. Um, in many societies, certainly in the United States, I would imagine probably in Brazil as well, there's a um, meaningful correlation between political conservatism and religiosity or avowed religiosity belief. Um, that's not to say that you can't have, that these aren't distinct constructs because they certainly are. Um, but one issue in a lot of the work on this that I'm trying to address in my own work is that you have, on the one hand, you've got the literature interested in politics, and on the other hand, you've got the literature interested in religion. And so what I've done in a couple studies is I've tried to measure both and include both as covariates um, so that we can see to what extent it's really about religion, for example. I can tell you about a recent study where we had people who are in a, interested in a, 
learning how to fight with knives. I don't know if, if this is a common thing in Brazil. Uh, I, I was not actually aware of how common it was here, but in Los Angeles, people want to take martial arts knife fighting classes. And we partnered with a group. In fact, one of our um, the, the collaborators on this, Jeremy Pollack, also has a sort of sideline occasionally. He, he's a very skilled martial artist himself and, and does these classes sometimes. So they were doing these classes and we were able to partner with them and conduct a, a very interesting field study, which was the, the strongest part of it is that it was valid. This wasn't sort of hypothetically you're on MTurk. What if I was outside fighting with knives right now? Or what if I'm in a video game? No, they're outside. It was hot. They're sweating and they're learning how to fight with knives. And then uh, they're jumping around and they're engaging in essentially um, gang knife fights or something like this. Not unlike something you might see in West Side Story. Um, but in this case, it's, it's, it's our research study. And what we did in this study was pretty simple. We we asked them to report their own at the end of the of the day. We asked them to report their own feeling of spiritual connectedness with either God or the divine or some larger supernatural power um, that we left sort of um, undefined. So even people who were kind of spiritual but not religious could answer this question. And we also asked them about their avowed just doctrine final religious beliefs. Do you believe in God? Do you believe, and so forth. And in addition to that, we did an experimental manipulation in which we had them engage in what effectively was a form of group prayer, although we didn't ever use that word, the P word. Um, we called it a guided visualization. And we had a speaker, like one of these portable speakers. And so it looked as if it was just sort of to, um, uh, to, to hear it. We asked everyone to take a knee. So what we did was we contrived a circumstance where people are on bended knee, all together in a circle, listening to this visualization. And in one of the visualizations, it's, uh, it describes a supernatural force or higher power that is allying with them during the battle, and it's going to be with them, is going to um, assist them, that wants them to win, and so forth. And in the control, uh, it's the same voice, but describing a very beautiful nature scene. We chose that because in this way, both of the both of the visualizations are very positively balanced, but they differ in their content, where in the one you have a supernatural ally and in the other you have a beautiful tree. And in both cases, there's a tactile component, like you're feeling the, the supernatural force versus you're feeling the bark of the tree and so forth. And we found that as an effect of this listening to this visualization, people did feel more confident and how they and their group would perform, especially in the study of how well they would perform in the battle and how likely they would be to win a rematch and so forth. Um, and so that was consistent with the idea that perceiving oneself as having supernatural support will lead you to have more confidence in engaging in violent conflict. This was very satisfying because I had done a, a study a few years before that, which I, the more time goes by, the less happy I am with it. Because it was one of these things where we got quote unquote significant effects, but the effect sizes were extremely small. And it's hard to know from that kind of research how well it translates to real life or what difference it makes at all. But in that study, what we did was we just subtly primed people with words related to supernatural support. And we found a similar effect, but in this case, it was another one of these studies where people measure the size and strength of an enemy. And so people who had been experimentally primed with thoughts of profits and supernatural support and so on, they rated this violent criminal as smaller and weaker. But again, it was a very small effect. So it was nice to sort of conceptually replicate this in a real, quote unquote, um, field study involving knife combat. And to be clear, they weren't real knives. Uh, they were these sort of hard plastic simulated knives, but they were sharp enough that we had to have band-aids and we used them and they hurt. So there was genuine uh, risk. You, you didn't want to get stabbed with one of these things in the battle. And if, you, if anyone looks up that, that, there's some pretty interesting video archived of a couple of the battles as well. And finally, we did a paintball study. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Before I go on, in the knife fighting study, we also measure political orientation in a somewhat comprehensive way um, using a, a, not just a single item, but we asked a, a, about 20 questions probing political orientation and formed a composite measure. And... When you looked at that political score by itself, it replicated the sort of thing we've been talking about already. So um, political orientation also predicted 
battle confidence in this real knife fighting battle. But what was interesting is when we put both religiosity and political orientation into the same model, in this study, in this sample, political orientation washed out and it no longer was a predictor. And it turns out that it had been, those effects had been explained away uh, by, by uh, the feelings of, of religious faith. I don't think that means that the whole political orientation and battle confidence hypothesis is wrong at all. This is a rather left-leaning sample as well. If we'd had a more balanced or more right-leaning sample, we might have found the, the opposite result. Um, but is it, it is interesting, and it points to the need to take, um, and when you're looking at either religiosity or political orientation, you should definitely account for the other, um, especially if you're in a society in which they co-vary in a, in a, in a non-trivial way. I want to say a quick word about the, the meta theory of this. So why would religiosity promote battle confidence? Well, there's a, have you interviewed any cognitive scientists of religion for this? Uh, just one, Edward Slingerland. I'm trying to get more on the show, but I've, I've not been able yet. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll get someone like Pascal Boyer or um, Pierre Lenard or somebody like that, um, or Justin Barrett. You know, actually, after this, I have I have a recommendation for you. <laughs> we'll do it afterwards. I think you should talk to Claire Kravitz. But at any rate, um, long story, not long. I'm really going to keep it short. There is a unfortunate tendency to try to explain religion in one-liners. Oh, it's for this. Oh, it's to explain death. Oh, it's you know, no, <laughs> it's not. Uh, there, are, it's a very complex phenomena. It's a very underspecified phenomena. Um, not unlike morality, not unlike political orientation. Um, it breaks down into multiple components. Those components may vary between societies. Religion is not the same everywhere. Religion, in some sense, may even be a Western construct. Um, th there may be some other way to carve up the the sphere of beliefs about the world, which some people would call spiritual, religious, something else. Um, however, there's a very interesting perspective. So having said that, I'm now going to be simplistic. Um, that says that the content of certain kinds of beliefs about the supernatural may have effects at the group level, which lead those groups to be more successful in something like cultural group selection. And that even though many aspects of religious cognition may be byproducts of ordinary cognition. So for example, I have an ability to imagine you have a mind and I hope you're having the same uh, imagining. And so we can envision invisible minds in other people and that may set the stage for invis envisioning invisible minds in the sky or elsewhere as a byproduct. But if certain kinds of belief systems can exploit this propensity, then you may get certain kinds of religions or, or structured beliefs about the supernatural, which have effects, real effects on cultures and on societies that lead to things like greater cooperation because you don't, you think that the, the gods or the ghosts are watching you. Um, so you don't transgress um, as well, or you're more supportive or, you know, it sort of makes you uh, a better group member. And that this may have ramifications at the group level where belief in certain kinds of gods, like big, powerful gods that are moral, that will judge you and punish you if you commit certain kinds of violations which would harm the group. This may make certain kind these groups more competitive and that you may then see these groups be more successful in the sense of growing and expanding over history. This is kind of the big gods hypothesis that R. Norn Zion and others have had. He'd be that'd be, that'd be a good good person to talk to. Uh, but at any rate, um, our work on religiosity and battle confidence fits into this sort of big god story. I mean, it's consistent with it, and there may be something there. But even if you accept that story, it's important to keep in mind that there's tremendous cross cultural variation, and that not not every religious belief is of this character. And that not every human society has contains beliefs of this kind. So I get very nervous when people start even using the word re religion, even though I've used it rather um, broadly here, because it's often really unclear what we're even talking about. 
but yes, in our United States sample, which is certainly the the um, sort of Judeo-Christian Islamic uh, version of religiosity in which there are these powerful supportive agents which will, you know, give you candy if you're good and punish you if you're bad and uh, may lead people to be more confident um, when they're in, in all kinds of um, dangerous circumstances, but including um, circumstances where they need to confront an enemy. Mm hmm. Yes, God, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And since we're talking about religion, so we've, we've been focusing a lot on uh, intergroup conflict and how things we do during war and other things like that might reduce threat salience and promote group cohesion, let's say. But would you say that, and, and since we're talking about religion now, would you say that perhaps in an everyday normal social context that religion might also have played and still plays a role in societies where we have religious people uh, still uh, in promoting group cohesion by reducing threat salience from other groups even though people are not considering uh, intergroup conflict at the moment well i gotta say i don't know um because it's a it's a quite a it's it's i can imagine a number of contexts that that might apply to what i will say that might speak to this is that well in my own research with and with my colleagues i've focused on confidence and engaging in intergroup conflict and sort of had a um a Klingon kind of uh, perspective on belief that one has these supportive agents in which, you know, you rush into battle with greater confidence in, uh, in, your, in one's victory, that that is really only one dimension of this. And history, and again, this, this is anecdata, data, but history is replete with examples of people who were deeply devout and did tremendously personally risky, brave things I'm thinking here, for example, of the, the the Buddhist monks in Vietnam who immolated themselves, and, I, and there are other examples um, during during World War II and other conflicts um, where uh, believers took great risks to help protect other people um, and hide them, for example, um, or in the liberation theology movements in Latin America and, and other places that have been part of what they've done is they've dissolved. Um, parochial boundaries and, and brought people together or they've tried to resist war or even been overtly associated with pacifism. And I think that it's very plausible that their faith was a big part of that as well. Um, so, so I don't think that believing one has spiritual allies makes one bloody minded. I think in some contexts it could certainly lead you to, it could help bolster your confidence and your ability to actually take the risk of building bridges with other people or incurring risk to yourself, um, including possibly the risk of, I mean, think about missionaries who go to places where people are sick. Um, they, they, they do get sick, they die, you know, they go anyway. Their faith is probably a big part of that, their ability to do that, to have that confidence. And one can imagine um, opening oneself up to the potential threat or perceiving others as less threatening and being more willing to open your arms to them could also be related to this kind of belief system for sure mm -hmm. okay so just perhaps one last question and this is also sort of related to religion because it is one of the cognitive modules that some people associate with religion that is that religion is a byproduct of this module as well that is the hyperactive agency detection device would you say that because we have the sort of instinct to think that if something happened there and i don't know what caused it perhaps it might have been someone that is an agent that caused it would you say that that could also be related to uh, threat and in that case people would be perceiving threat from uh, an, uh, an imagined source? Well, for once I can give you a short answer. Yes, 
<laughs> I mean, to slightly elaborate, I would say yes, but again, that's not, and with all respect to Stuart Guthrie and the hyperactive you know, to had, uh, um, it's certainly not the whole story. But yeah, I mean, is does the mind seem to be set up in such a way that we have what you would call um, what Marty Hazelton and others call the error management, uh, it's kind of proclivity to err on the side of the less costly error or a kind of smoke alarm hypothesis notion that, you know, if it could be an agent, let's infer an agent and act accordingly. Sure, <laughs> that can happen, but I would I would be cautious of anyone over claiming how much of big R relig re religious cognition or how much of the story is really explained by that. I think you use the word module, the M word. Um, I think that one of the things that's, that's, that should be better appreciated, and a lot of people who work in cognitive science and religion have been beating this drum for a while. I, I would especially encourage people to look at um, uh, Ryan McKay and Harvey Whitehouse have some interesting writing about this theoretically about the idea of fractionating religion into its components. Um, because we all talk about it as if we know what it is, except when we start trying to make a list or actually look carefully at what is or is not. So, you know, certain sort of political figures have a somewhat cult-like following. Um, is that a religion? Um, and you can go on and on down this road. So I think that things like detecting other minds or vigilance in a threat kind of sense towards the potential presence of other minds, that might be one kind of module or one piece that can be articulated into religious belief. But there's probably a number of different modules um, that that all need to come into play or that get toggled on and off and in some particular pattern, sometimes we call that religion. But whether or not it's one, you know, it's, I certainly don't think there's sort of a, I've done some, some work on this and some neuroscience work, and my least favorite question is about the God module or some, some sort of essentializing of some small system just for religion. That doesn't seem to be the case at all. It seems to be a number of different modules, form networks. We call that kind of holistically, we look at it and say, oh, that's religion. Mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps I was not clear before, but I was not really saying that religion is the result of a single module. I was saying that the hyperactive agency detection device was just one of them. And there are yes. even people, there are even people like, for example, I think Pascal Boyer that proposed that it is the result of, uh, that it is the byproduct of several different modules like the hyperagent uh, hyper detection device like the promiscuous teleology, folk biology, right. folk physics, folk psychology, and I mean, a lot of other stuff. So j just to get that point clear. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no I, I, I didn't, I didn't necessarily take you as saying that. I just was um, having a counterfactual experience of someone who doesn't know these names and is completely foreign to this, possibly misunderstanding. So I was just sort of jumping on my soapbox. But yeah, I, we, we agree. Okay, great. Okay, so Dr. Holbrook, just before we go, would you like to share with people what are some of the best online resources for them to get in touch with your work? Well, the easiest way is um, my website. It's just my name, uh, colinholbrook.com uh, with one L. The Well, two L's if you count the L in Holbrook, but uh, C-O-L-I-N, Holbrook. Dot com. And another thing is, we haven't had a chance to talk about it, but um, I've started in the last year or two um, working on human-robot interaction from a threat point of view. And so that's something that I just wanted to throw out as an interest. So um, there's going to be, there's data, some, a little bit of data has come out uh, in a paper that one can find on my website and uh, more to come. Actually, I hadn't, I truly hadn't planned this, but just if you just jazzes up the video at all. Got a, ro a robot head. Uh, I keep it, okay. it watches me. Not unlike the hyperaction, the hyperactive agency detector. I find having this robot head staring at me makes me work more at my computer. <laughs> okay, great. So let's leave the interview with that.
Uh, I will leave links in the description box for people to go check your work out, your workout. And again, thank you a lot for taking the time. It was really a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I probably talked too much, but I, but I really did enjoy it very much. Thank you again for having me. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and see if you can make a pledge there. I would really be thankful for that. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanche, Per Helga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gelinas and Jim Frank. Thank you a lot for all.